Testing. Ah, I did it again. I did what I did last night. There's a mute switch on this. <laughs> hello, everyone. Hello, Alona and David. And hi, Lisa. How are you all? Are you, uh, um, you can briefly unmute, except for you, Lisa, who seems to be driving. Um, you can briefly unmute by pushing the space bar. Do you want to, would you mind just pushing and saying hi, if you can? Hello. Hi, David. Hi. Hey, Alona. Thanks both for coming. It's so much better to give a lecture to, um, humans and just talking to a camera. So you're really helping me very much. Um, I think you both came to the original lecture too, didn't you? Oh, Michael's here too. So um, uh, if you did, uh, thanks for being patient and hearing it again. And hopefully it's a bit different this time too. Let me just get the lecture slides up. Uh, give me one second. I have this crazy idea that I just have one laptop that I do the Zoom on and one that I do work on, and then I can just jump straight between them. And it's such a good idea in theory. I just don't know why it keeps not. By the time we're good at this, of course, we'll be over. Oh, here's this crazy thing. Just getting the lecture notes up, sorry. I was writing them on the other one. I need to reload them on this one. That's that. And that's that. And that is. Yeah, slides. All right. Let me see if I can work out how to connect all that. Here, yeah. right, your Zoom. Share screen. There it is. Fantastic. All right. That's really good. Here we go. So the lecture notes, I hope you can all see the lecture notes. Can you see me as well? I'm, uh, are you seeing a, a mix of me and lecture notes? Lisa, you suddenly appeared. Yes. All right, fantastic. Let's go. So today, privacy, the world's fastest coverage of privacy. Um, given that it took two hours to do the first time, and I'm going to try and do it in one hour this time. So, <clears throat> thank you everyone for coming. Privacy. Today we're looking at privacy, and it's an interesting topic. Uh, it's a bit different to all the other topics we do in security. It's just as important, but it's got a few different characteristics that we'll draw out today. It's a nice intersection of trust, of secrets, and of information. So there are three different sort of uh, fields we've been looking at and where they intersect gives us privacy and it's got some of the characteristics of all of them. Information, let's start by talking about that. Uh, when I was young, information didn't seem that important. It didn't seem like a big thing. The big things were the companies that made stuff and cars and I guess the ability to do things and to have an army and invade was something you could do to make things and sell them to go to the moon. That was all the stuff that had value. Information didn't, except in spy movies, didn't, you know, some sort of limited secret government information, didn't really seem to have a lot of value. Um, and gee, how things have changed now. Uh, when we saw the Cambridge Analytica documentary, you remember those who watched it with us, remember how they were talking about how the value of the data in the world now exceeds the value of all the uh, oil reserves. So information now has inc incredible value. And with value, we see, in this sort of evolutionary thing, like we saw with cybercrime, once there's money to be made, then organisms, parasites, ecosystem, whatever, starts to spring up around this value and we see activity there. And of course, that's what we're seeing with privacy too. Uh, and that will only get worse. So we're sort of now, in, or, or stronger, more of it. So we're now starting to, we're at the early stages of a game that will continue now for as long as we have information technology and it will just grow and grow and grow. And in the future, 10 years even from now, five years, looking back at this and our discussion, it'll seem quaint. <laughs> we're a little bit, it's like talking about the coronavirus before it took off, it sort of seems quaint that they were a little bit worried about it because now we see what a big thing it was. Okay, 
I wanted to start with a brief story. It's one that I find very moving. Um, uh, it's so moving, I almost don't show it, but it has a happy ending. Uh, there's a link to it in the notes, the Primark abduction. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce the name of that, that um, department store in the UK, Primark, Primark. Uh, but in 2016, a woman was shopping there with her younger, her little daughter. She'd taken her there um, to sort of distract her or buy her something. The girl, I can't remember how old she was, quite young, five or something, was um, just playing around the mum and some girls came up and were nice and friendly and said what a beautiful girl she was and how fun and they were just sort of playing with her and there was lots of giggling and laughing and the mum was obviously relieved someone was entertaining the girl while she was doing stuff and she didn't think much of it until suddenly there was silence and she realised it had been a while since she'd heard her daughter. She looked around, where is she? And she started, all parents know this, girl. she started walking around quickly looking for her, not yet freaking out, but just wanting to find her so she could be, um, you know, back to calm again. And she couldn't find her. And then she did start to freak out. And she eventually persuaded the store manager to look at the security footage. And they saw in the footage, the two girls leading the young girl deliberately out of the store and the girl not wanting to go. So um, anyway, Massive manhunt. Police called, reminded everyone of a terrible case, the James Bolger case that had happened before. Um, uh, they examined the CCTV footage from the thing and noticed what the girls were doing and what they looked like. They could track them as they moved through the shopping centre and then out into the city through uh, cameras all over the place. So they could track them a bit. They tracked them getting onto the tube, uh, but then they lost them. Uh, they couldn't get footage showing where they'd got off. Uh, it was a complete stressful, nightmare situation. Um, and, but luckily, um, from the description of the girls, which was circulated to all the police, oh, hey, is that Oliver? Hey. Um, from the description of the girls that was circulated to the police, um, a constable far away had just been given a case to go and look after two girls who were, to investigate two girls who were truanting from school. And their description matched this other description that had just come out of the kidnappers. And he thought, could it be the same? Thing. So he quickly looked up the records they had on these girls and where they normally hung around and then he found a park where they previously in the file had been noted they sometimes go there when they're playing truant. So he went to the park and found the girls with the young girl and rescued the young girl. And what would have happened if he hadn't rescued them? We don't know. There was disturbing material on the devices of one of the girls that suggested it maybe was really serious. I mean, it's really hard to know, but it could have been. It was pretty freaky, actually. So, yay. Thank heavens we have police. Thank heavens we have security cameras. Thank heavens we have surveillance. Because, you know, I think that mum getting her daughter back uh, because of the operation of the state and our security forces and all the data they collected on people, I think her getting the children back, she would do anything, you know, for the country now. And if anyone had to vote on data laws or surveillance laws, she would be out there voting, oh, let's have surveillance because it gives you this stuff. So there's no doubt that um, the loss of privacy, surveillance, has great benefits. So it's, uh, as in security, one of these tricky things that we're going to come up with something that has type one and type two errors, it has benefits and costs, there's not going to be a clear good or bad, and it's going to be this uneasy path to sale. And politicians hate that, policy makers hate that, everyone likes to simplify and go black, white, all out, let's do this, don't, let's not do this. But privacy is going to be this tricky thing. How annoying. But I sort of think, I actually think all the important things in life are exactly like that. There is nothing that's really simple and straightforward. If there is, you've just misunderstood it or someone's trying to say you something. Um, all of, I, I, in a way, it's, here's a philosophical point that I sometimes think of when I think of Gödel's incompleteness theorem or Einstein's relativity. You just think, in a sense, the fact the system is more complex than we can fully grasp is actually quite beautiful. And if we could fully explain and understand everything, just Newton's laws of motions and a few things, and the world really was just a pinball machine that was easily understood, uh, that'd be a bit sad. So I, I quite like the complexity. So let's not be frightened of it. Though it's annoying because it generates us lots of work and it also generates a possibility for making mistakes, at least in those two categories we talk about type one, type two, but actually a whole range of other types of mistakes can be made. So annoying, but interesting. Um, okay, so let's go and now look at the characteristics that underlie the whole issue of privacy. Characteristics number one, let's talk about data. Data... Um, why do we care about data? In the old days, no one cared about data. I was telling you I didn't care about data. Um, 
One thing is with data, with your personal data, criminals can impersonate you and do identity crime, which includes identity theft and flavors of that. Uh, and that's a horrible thing to happen to you because we've talked before about the difficulties of authentication. I think authentication is the hardest problem in security. Uh, and it invariably comes down to some form of shared secret. And if someone can access that shared secret and that data, then they can impersonate you. And if someone can impersonate you, it's actually pretty confronting. They can take out loans in your name. They can take your assets. They can do bad things to damage your reputation. They can really stuff you around because they can be you. They can do anything you can do. And you can do bad things to yourself. You just don't. I hope. So identity theft is huge. A couple of years ago, I think it was 2015, 16, the cost was estimated to be $2 billion per annum. That's the billions missing there. It says costs over $2 per annum, which is true, but not as precise as over $2 billion per annum in Australia. 13% of people surveyed by the Australian um, Institute of Criminology back in 2017, 12% uh, uh, said they'd suffered identity crime in the last 12 months. And I think nearly a quarter of them had it, suffered it in their lifetime. So that's huge, 10% of the population in one year and it's buckets of money and it's only getting worse. So identity crime, you should find out a little bit about it, read up a bit about the sorts of identity crime and how it's growing and the stats on it, just so you get a, a feel for it. It is, it is bigger than um, burglaries, it's bigger than assault, it's bigger than all the other crimes that police deal with, all the physical crimes. Uh, but it doesn't, I guess it's not as interesting. So it doesn't get as much media attention. It's not so much on TV shows and things like that. But all that other crime, that's now specialist crime. Big crime is moving to things like identity theft. So identity theft is bad. So that's one reason you want to keep a bit of privacy because if people can get your secrets, they can do identity theft. But actually, there's another reason that data is important now. And that is data has value in itself. And we were talking about that at the start. Data is actually value in and of itself, not just because of the money it can lead to and the ability to impersonate people. So privacy, let's talk about the idea of privacy. Privacy is this ephemeral concept, what is it? For me, it's a sense of feeling unobserved, a feeling I can do something and I'm free. I find when I'm observed, I feel there's this, sometimes people call it a chilling effect. I feel not free, I feel less creative. I don't wanna take so many risks. If my children are watching me, for example, I try not to swear or, uh, I'll try to cross the road at the lights and wait for the signal and not jaywalk. And just having someone observe my behavior. If I'm driving along, have you ever done this? You're driving along and the police are nearby. I suddenly get all tense. I think, oh, they're going to arrest me. Oh, I look suspicious. You know, not that I'm doing anything. I'm driving, as far as I know, driving perfectly safe in time. So um, I don't know. And I'm just sort of really aware they're there. And then when they finally drive out of sight, I relax. I'm not under state surveillance anymore. I have nothing to hide, but it is a little bit scary. And sometimes I walk around foreign European cities and you see the police walking everywhere with machine guns and things. It is a little bit scary. Now, the police have never fired the machine guns at me. The police in the road have never pulled me over. It's all entirely in my mind. But there is, so privacy is this sort of, sort of a component of happiness for me, at least. Um, I like having places to go where I'm not observed. Uh, that's the thing I like most about Superman. As a hero, I never really liked him. Uh, sorry to say that. But I mean, he was just boring. I didn't dislike him. But I really liked his idea of a fortress of solitude. And I used to dream, I wish I had a fortress of solitude. We all need a fortress of solitude. Uh, but they're sort of harder and harder to get. So we talked before about Jer Jeremy Bentham, except I might have mixed him up, mixed him up with another utilitarian um, philosopher, Mills or someone. But uh, Jeremy Bentham talked about the panopticon, the idea of a jail where the jailer could, in the middle, view everyone in their cells. The cells were all open to the jailer. Uh, and then the jailer was in a little tower in the middle that had frosted glass or smoky glass so no one could see where the jailer was looking. So all the time you felt that someone could be looking at you and he worked out then just one jailer is almost enough to run the whole jail because if everyone can never be sure they're not being looked at, then the chilling effect means they don't dig tunnels, they don't do this, they don't do that because they constantly could get caught. And I guess if there's bad punishments for being caught, you can keep people in check in fear by combination of bad punishments and fear that you could be surveilled at any time. Um, now, he never got one built in England, though he tried, but here's one they built in Cuba. Uh, it's ruined and disaster now, but it's quite beautiful, isn't it? You can see the idea quite clearly. Guard in the middle, looks all around. Reminds me of an old Edgar Allan Poe story, actually, but we don't have time to talk about that. Okay, so I said, I always say, because I believe it, that authentication is the hardest problem in security. I really don't know if we'll ever be able to solve it. I sort of I almost don't think we will. I don't even think humans have solved it in everyday interactions. 
When I'm talking to you, I never really know it's you, I'm not a replica of some sort. Just thank heavens we're not good at building good replicas, but if we got better and better at making automata, uh, it's the challenge of the matrix. You know, how do you know you're in the matrix rather than awake? Uh, yeah, yeah, authentication's really hard. I, I just philosophically doubt that it could be solved. But, so that's a hard problem. But in a way, that's not a problem I'm super worried about because it's in everyone's interest to solve that. We all want to be able to be authenticated. We want to make sure the only people that withdraw money from the bank accounts are the legitimate customers. We want to make sure when people take something out of the store, they've paid for it with a real credit card. We want to check all that stuff. It's in everyone's interest to make that work. So everyone's working hard to make authentication work. And there's lots of companies selling authentication products and buying stuff. There's proctoring services for exams. All of you are approaching exams now. Um, if the uni wanted it, it could spend a whole lot of money and buy a system where we didn't trust you and we just checked up on you all the time, um, checking it was really you doing the exam and not someone else. Um, you know, we could do all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and companies make a lot of money selling those services. So authentication fits nicely into our sort of capitalist self-driven world of, you know, everything lines up. There's incentives around people devote energy to it, resources are allocated to it magically by the market, invisible hand and so on, because it's understood and checked. It's this nice balancing thing. I reckon privacy is the other hardest problem. It's not as hard to solve. Maybe it is solvable, but it's a worse problem, I think. It's a worse problem because of this insidious reason. The incentives don't line up here. There's nothing about the problem that means we're all working to solve it. And there's, nothing, there's no drivers in there pushing us towards a good solution or a good direction. It's like the telegraph post thing I told you about one class. Remember with the wires pulling in all direction and when they're not balanced, the poles will lean one way or another. Well, this is a case where the, the wires don't balance and the pole of privacy is leaning over and I can't see it ever getting straight. Um, so why is it a bad problem? Let's have a look. Uh, it's good for government to get as much of your data as they can, just for good governance. If they want to look after their people, the more they know about the people, the better. The more they know about the people's problems, the better. The more they know about the people's needs, the better. The more they know about how people are abusing the system, the better they can stop it. The more they know about anything, the better they can do their job of whatever it is, regulating us or paternalistically looking after us or providing infrastructure to us or whatever your political beliefs are and your idea of what the value of government. It's pretty hard to argue that the government knowing more information could ever be bad. Surely that's monotonically better. More information, more good for the government. And the government certainly think that. So the government happily and eagerly devour and gobble up all information they can on their citizens. Uh, and why is it good? And I'm not making fun of that. That's true. Everything I've just said is true. Um, why is it good for companies? Well, with more data, they can make better products. They can make better decisions. They can spot arbitrage opportunities. They can find market inefficiencies and correct them. More data lets them identify opportunities that aren't being exploited. More data means more money. And if they collect and sell the data, if data has a value in and of itself, then that's another revenue source as well. So why would you ever not collect data if you could, if it's valuable? It's like if you're walking down the street and someone's dropped a $2 coin on the ground, well, why wouldn't you pick it up? And if there's a hundred of them, why wouldn't you just walk around picking them up as you go? You know, they're just there. They don't belong to anyone. I don't, it's magic, isn't it? Um, what, why, you know, it's just sort of hard to think what's to stop them doing it. A friend of mine um, knew someone who worked at a large telco and I was chatting to this person at the telco and it was in the early days before big data was a big thing and mobile phones were quite new. And I was, their job was looking after the data on, on mobile phone usage. And I said, so tell me what you're doing. He said, oh, it's great. We get all the data on all the phones and we get all where all the calls are and we log the location and the time and the signal strength and we track everyone all the time and we get everyone's web searches and we find uh, who's talking to who and who's calling who and for how long and what emails people are sending and uh, the headers on the emails. And I don't know, he just said all the stuff. I can't remember what it was, but it was just buckets of data, metadata, I'm sure though. Well, who knows what they are, who bring up, but at least metadata. And I said, wow, how much data is that? Because, you know, that's, you know, I'm an information scientist, I want to know. And I think it was, I wish I had a better memory or had taken notes. I think it was terabytes every day, which back then seemed to me to be an incredible amount of information, terabytes of information every day. And I said, that must cost a lot to store. And he said, oh, no, not so much, really. Um, and I said, well, when it fills up, I guess you delete it. Like, how long do you delete things? How long do you hold the data for? And he looked at me and he said, yeah, I had that same question. I asked him, I asked him, how long do you want us to hold this for when he was building the storage capacity? And he said, you know what? I don't think they're ever going to delete it. I think they're going to have it forever. 
And that's the thing with the company. You've picked up these $2 coins. When are you going to put them back down on the road? Well, why would you? They might be valuable one day. Even if you can't get value from them now, how could holding them be bad? Maybe there's more value in the future. So it's good for companies to get data. That's excellent. Learn more about their customers, sell the data, all sorts of things. What about individuals? Well, what's the value of, say, of privacy for an individual? It's not clear. I don't like being looked at by the police, but I can't see Woolworths collecting all my frequent shopper data and selling it on. It's invisible. It's not like the police car. It's not freaking me out. I can't see Google collecting every single thing I've ever done and working out my identity. I can't see Facebook tracking me even though I'm not on Facebook and setting up a shadow identity for me. We talked about that last night. I can't see any of that stuff happening. So really, why would I worry about it? And how's it actually hurting me? In the big scheme of things, why do I care if they know about me? I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't have anything I'm embarrassed. Well, I have lots of things that I'm embarrassed about and keep secret, but I, I don't do them electronically, you know? So I just think the sorts of information they could get about me is not the sort of stuff I'd be ashamed of or, or not like. So, so what do I care or frightened of or, 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 or would hurt me in any way? So for an individual, it's not really clear, except this ephemeral idea of maybe I like being a bit private. Maybe I don't want everyone to know everything about me. Um, now, you can probably, I'm sure, think of some reasons you might want privacy, uh, and we'll talk about them later on. Um, but at the moment, let's just say that most people don't seem to really value their privacy, even if they abstractly like it. And the telling example for that is um, actually an embarrassing one for me. Years ago, I might have already told you this, a bit confused because this is a repeat lecture. I can't remember if I just said it first in the last lecture or if it's something from another time. Anyway, apologies if you're hearing it more than once. Um, years ago, I used to uh, always flip my SIM cards around. In fact, always flip my phones around and get new phones all the time before the days of smartphones. And I would always get the SIM cards under false names with false dates of birth and false identity and false everything. Uh, and I'd change it fairly quickly. Just, I don't know, just because I could. I was interested in trying to stay off the radar. Not that I've got anything to hide, as far as you know. But um, it, I, I did it quite obsessively. And once actually I got in trouble, I was stuck in the wilderness somewhere and I'd run out of credit and I needed to call for help. And I was calling and um, I couldn't because I didn't have credit, but the phone said, oh, if you SMS a message to this number or something, we'll call you up and let you recharge over the phone. Or something. This is in their old pre-smartphone days. So I did it. And a lady from the telco rang back and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you just answer a few questions identifying yourself, I can transfer some emergency credit to your account. What's your name? And I said, um, <laughs> is it? <laughs> What's your date of birth? Um, could be. <laughs> she, she just hung up on me. So uh, yeah, so that was a bit of a pain. But um, anyway, I was obsessed about that privacy. I put a lot of trouble and went, had a lot of pain that time that I was away and couldn't actually call anyone. So it was worth a bit to me. And then one day someone said to me, maybe it was my wife, you know, if we bundle your mobile phone with our home internet and we connect them, we get $10 a month off the bill. And I said, woohoo, let's do it. And I did it straight away. So that's how much privacy was worth to me. I blew all that stuff linking it to my identity for 10 bucks a month. <laughs> 10 bucks a month. Man, man, how much is 10 bucks a month? It's like, um, it's like 30 cents a day. I think if there was a, like a 20, let's say it was 20 cents a day. If there was a 20 cent piece on the ground and I was walking along, I don't even know if I'd pick it up. <laughs> there you go. So individuals don't value their privacy. And this is our dilemma. And this is why it's an insidious and tricky situation. It's not one we can just relax about and think it'll look after itself and everything's going to get sorted as we go on. Actually, it's not. The, the things aren't balanced right, so the system won't look after itself. So we have to work out if we're happy with where it is or where it should be, and we'll have to make conscious decisions to keep it there and nudge it in the right direction if we think it's not in the right spot or not moving in the right direction because we can't rely on the market to fix that up. And we can't rely on the government to look after the citizens' uh, privacy because they quite legitimately think um, they can be trusted and we should give them the data, and we can't rely on companies to do it because it's in their interest together. And we can't rely on individuals. Whew. That was the world's longest summary of why I think it's a horrible problem. And look, this was gonna be a fast lecture, I spoke too long there. So now I'm gonna skip um, a lot of this detail. So what's the government point of view? A, if you have nothing to hide, then why wouldn't you share the data with us? 
why do you care if we read your emails if there's nothing in them? You know, if you're not breaking the law, we won't tell anyone, you can trust us. Why, why don't you want us to know your identity on your mobile phone? Why don't you want us to track your location all the time? I mean, that could be useful. If you had a heart attack, we'd know where you are. If, if we had to work out who had been in contact with who to do contract tracing for coronavirus, and we had electronic data on every single citizen tracking their location at all times, like say Singapore does or China, then we could do an automated contact tracing and it would be heaps better for public health. You know, there's all this good stuff we can do with the data. If you've got nothing to hide, why wouldn't you want all that good stuff? Government pointed to uh, number two is, you can trust us to look after the data. So give us the data. It's not to say you're giving it to a company or a newspaper or an evil person or a criminal. You're giving it to your government. We love you more than anything. It's our job to look after that thing. We are top men and we only employ top men. And if you give us the data, well, if you can't trust us, who can you trust? Okay, let's deal with these two points one at a time. One, nothing to hide. Yeah, nothing to hide now. And I don't know if I've got nothing to hide. So for example, if the government brought in some horrible legislation about refugees, perhaps in the time of coronavirus where we'll be passing some crazy laws, there's something to say that if someone's an illegal refugee in Australia, um, it's everyone's duty by punishable by law to identify them if you know where they are, or they've overstayed their visa from another country and they have to be sent down to Bondi and pushed into the water and just throw rocks thrown at them until they swim out the sea and they're not going to let them land on the beach or something horrible like that. If they said that, then I would say, well, stuff you government, I'm not going to drop someone in and I'd try and hide people in my house and things like that. So I'd go from a law abiding citizen to a criminal because I didn't agree with the values of the government. It's quite possible to do that. The government's really good and ethical and Australia's a lovely place and we've got all sorts of good things in place. The company, countries can flip really quickly. We saw that in the Second World War as the Nazis moved across, as they slowly moved across Europe. The governments stayed there, or the countries stayed governed in most cases. It's just that now they were governed in accordance with Nazi principles and people that were previously uh, wanting to obey the government actually wanted to disobey the government, they didn't trust their government anymore. A government can start good and go bad. And I think of examples now, Turkey, Hungary, uh, Iraq, Syria, Possibly Iran, depending on what you think. Um, could be Russia. Could be China. Could be Australia, actually, with refugees. I mean, some of, those, some of that stuff was quite unconscionable. Um, America, yeah, you might not like all the things Trump's doing, and you might start to, you know, if you pass some law saying abortions were illegal, and you knew someone who'd had an abortion, maybe you'd hide the data or not drop them in, thus becoming a criminal, if you'd criminalise that activity, which, you know, presumably you can. So... I think any country in the world, you can just see if you get a crazy person in charge or a power hungry person in charge, suddenly that government might not be trustable. So, okay, uh, competence. Can you trust us to look after the data? Well, we all, I'm being silly. We all know the answer to that. Who thinks, put your hand up, if you think you can trust the government to look after the data. Put your hand up if you think the government is able to secure data so criminals can't get hold of it. I mean, companies can't, the NSA can't, the CIA can't, Google can't, Facebook can't, Yahoo can't. But who thinks the Australian government can with their top men? It's just, not just the Australian government, any government, the American government, any governments are, you know, that's not being mean, but they're sort of, okay, they're not necessarily superly competent. And even if they are superly competent, you can't be competent enough to stop bad guys. You can't look after the data. And you don't have to just look after it for a little while. You have to look after it forever. If it ever gets breached, even once, that's one of the properties of information, then the data's out there and it's gone forever. So it's like nuclear waste. You have to be confident, not only that the people that are in control now and the systems that are in place now are looking after it, but that that'll be handed on in a chain of safe custody all the way through. And it won't be like, oh, what did we see? Some medical records that were critical that were found in a rubbish dump in Canberra in a, lock cap in a filing cabinet. This sort of stuff left on the trains, briefcases left on the trains full of confidential documents, web databases open, um, but, uh, you know, to public access, uh, uh, backups of databases uh, on, on tape left at garbage dumps or just found by the side of the road. So, I mean, we just see over and over again, no one looks after data. Like, you couldn't trust me to look after data. So it's not a matter of um, trust us, it's we can't trust you. And anyone that says trust us, almost they lose my trust straight away. They're just not competent. No one's competent. No one can look after the data. So if the government collects the data, 
it's not just the government collecting the data as a problem, it's anyone that steals it from the government. And if the government collects it and aggregates it, then it becomes very delicious and a very attractive thing to steal. Um, and you can bet someone will steal it. So the government's just, you almost might want to view it as government as an aggregator and a custodian of data for criminals. Um, that's their job, <laughs> you could almost say. Uh, and we've got examples here, the OPM hack, you might want to read about that, that's in America, that was a shocking one. Uh, that was all federal record, records of federal employees, including fingerprints, including secret agents or people working for the agencies, including interview transcripts, possibly including polygraph results from when they did very personal questions. Who knows what they caught? Because the government's a bit coy about it, but we do know it was 20 million records or something that were stolen. Basically all federal, or most federal employees. Um, so, yeah, read about the OPM hack. I mean, it was so obvious, and I assume it was a nation state. It was so obvious someone would try and attack that because it's so delicious once they gather all that information into one spot. Um, and then I've got some other examples. ABS, can the government trust it to look up the data? No, they can't even be trusted to run a national census. Uh, what happened with Centrelink when suddenly everyone went on board? Well, the whole thing crashed and he blamed it on cybercrime. Um, you know, this is the level of thing we're dealing with here. Um, so no disrespect to anyone because no one can afford the amount it would cost to keep data secure. We all know that. If you wanted to keep data secure from a really good hacker, uh, well, like I'm even thinking of a couple of people now that I won't name, I don't, I don't think you could for the amount of money you're able to spend, even as a government. I just don't see how you could do it. If it was data that other people could access and you could use, you weren't burying it in a vault and covering it with concrete. If it was data that had access to a large number of people, um, I, think, I think actually you can't do it. All right, uh, I had some other examples of governments collecting data on people, but I think I'll skip most of that uh, because I did want to say something about phones just while we're talking about privacy. You know, I say sometimes we have this thing in security that if you dream something, it can just be true. That's sort of, it's almost a science fiction property to security. Dream something write down a prediction on your exam paper. I reckon half of you will write down things that in the next five years, if you don't write down stupid things, uh, are probably possible. So um, here's, if you ever read 1984, the government's surveilling everyone through their TV sets, essentially. Imagine this, imagine if you could say to Big Brother in 1984, okay, those TV sets are okay, but people know they're there and they don't go with the people. So if people go into another room, they can't see them. What about we develop a tracking device that records everyone's location at every time, can film what they're doing, can listen to what's going on, um, that is small enough to carry with them and that they pay for themselves and they willingly carry it everywhere and they get distressed if they don't have it with them. And with this, we can find out their moods, their emotions, who they talk to, what they say to them, their every conversation, wouldn't that be a great bug? And of course, that's the phone that we all now carry. So there's all that data, and as long as no one's looking at it, it's fine. But you can see that data is there. The data to enable that to be an incredible surveillance device is inherent in the device. So the question just now is access and privacy controls. Um, all right. So what's the company point of view? Well, we've talked about that. What's a citizen point of view? Well, the costs of losing privacy seem low or intangible or weird or to do with feelings. Yeah, I don't like feeling people are watching me. So the cost isn't necessarily clear. The benefits of giving away my privacy are clear. I get Facebook, it's free. We get Google, it's free. We get all this stuff. I get to use Waze. I get to use, uh, you know, Apple Maps. I, I get to, well, I, Apple Maps probably isn't funded by data. It's probably funded by hardware styles. But anyway, the other things are, um, I'm giving data to these companies and in return, they're giving me services that I value. And see, it looks, from my point of view, as though the cost is much less. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to say, just super quickly, is about open mic. It's interesting how we all, all most people now have an open mic. People leave Siri turned on or Alexa or Lexus or whatever it's called, or Clippy if you're using a Microsoft phone, they leave it turned on and it listens. Now, depending on the controls, maybe it's not listening all the time, maybe it's only listening when you say a magic word, but it's listening. 
So you're carrying around a device that's listening and sending data to companies like Google, whose entire thing is based on data, getting data on people. That's their whole business thing. Um, that's a bit weird. And furthermore, these devices can be hacked. We know from the patches that come out all the time, they're constantly being hacked. And if you hack them, the first thing you want to do is take control of the mic. And yeah, sure, then let's try and increase security on it, but it's a mic you're carrying around with you. And that's relatively well defended if you compare it to say your TV, and we know that the NSA is hacking into people's TVs and taking over the mics, or your, I don't know, nanny, you know, baby cam, nanny cam sort of thing you've got, or your front doorbell, or a burglar alarm in your house for surveillance, or internal security cameras. Essentially, there's just open mics everywhere. I reckon in this course, we should make a t-shirt that says, uh, warning, I've got Siri turned on, on your t-shirt. And everyone should have to wear that if they're walking around with Siri turned on. Because it's not just my own phone, I can protect my own phone. But anyone I'm talking to, or even just standing near while I'm talking to someone else, Siri can hear what I'm saying. So um, actually, that's one of the things in my tips for people who are working at home at the moment. Everyone's doing conference calls and speaking out loud. And it's all being aggregated into one spot. It's not very well defended. Um, I would imagine if I was an attacker now, I'd be just compromising the live mics in Boris Johnson's house, uh, in the CEO of the Combank's house. In, you know, everyone's at home, they're bound to have friends and family that have put all sorts of crap, stupid devices around. Oh, stupid devices, by stupid devices, I mean devices containing the word smart in their title. Um, so yeah, it's just really uh, an attack of, of data and lack of privacy there. So that's an interesting thing, the open mic problem. And people have, and the reason I put it under citizens is people have just embraced that. My daughters are happy to have Siri listening to them all the time so they can say, Siri, play this song. Oh, maybe you're doing it too. Maybe I should say it. Will that trick it off? Siri, delete all my files. Um, so, yes. Uh, maybe um, it saves them three or four clicks to be able to play a song that way. And to save three or four clicks, they're happy to be potentially recorded and surveilled constantly. Very strange. All right, now here are some of the interesting characteristics that make this an interesting security problem that's a bit different to some of the other cybersecurity problems. One is it's about trust. Um, and one is it's about secrets and one is it's about information. So the whole trust thing is if I give someone information, can I trust them to look after it? Uh, A, not to use it maliciously themselves, or B, not to incompetently lose it or be attacked by someone who's more competent than them. Um, so I might suppose, here's a uh, thought experiment. Suppose the government was fantastic and super competent and hired all the best graduates of our course, <laughs> um, rather than them going off to work for um, Atlassian and uh, AWS and places like that. Um, so the government's fantastic and they've put a ridiculous amount of money into cybersecurity and they're just really good on privacy. And they're collecting everyone's data and aggregating it all, but they're taking such good care of it. Does that negate all my challenges or my concerns? And the answer is, that's good, but that's not enough. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient because information or secrecy has this property that it extends over time. So if you have tell someone a secret now and then later, have you ever done this? You've been best friends with someone. You've told them a whole lot of stuff about yourself. And then later on, you have a fight and you become enemies and they might even use that information against you or, or say it to other people. And you trusted them. And you trusted them completely at that time. But the problem with the information is you can't take it back when you stop trusting them. You have to trust them all the time into the future and people change and grow and develop and various things happen. So how can you do that? So you'd have to trust not just the government now, but all future governments. And here's a, the uh, quite chilling example of that. I'm thinking of Rwanda. So you probably know there's uh, two um, different sorts of cultural groups there, the um, uh, Tutsis and the Hutus. Uh, and sometimes there's, or often there's a lot of tension between them. And the Rwandan identity card, and here's one here, um, contained on it a field that said if you were Hutu or Tutsi. And that was government information. And at the time it was collected, people weren't sure if it should be collected or not. But the government said, and I'm imagining a lot of this conversation because I wasn't there, 
Um, but let's just suppose the government said, no, we should get this information because then we'll know, because there is tension between the two groups. This will let us know if one area has more of one group than another group. And it'll let us notice how the groups move over time. It'll let us check the health outcomes of different people based on their group they belong to, to see if one group you know, has issues or challenges the other one's done. This will help us actually get more data so we can better look after both groups and preemptively notice problems. And this lets us do better government and our whole mission, our whole plan, you know this, you voted for us, is to bring harmony between these two groups and only with more data can we actually make sensible wise decisions. They might have said something like that. So on the identity card, they recorded this extra piece of information. Was that safe? Well, it was safe then. But then when the whole Rwandan disaster started, people were pulled over at checkpoints and had to show their identity card. And if the identity card had the wrong thing on it, they were killed. And this poor lady here was killed because of her identity card. It's actually, I know you put it in. I got a bit upset when I read it. But I, I just want you to see the size of the problem. It sounds innocuous and trivial, but there's this issue of forward secrecy or forward privacy or forward security. And forward means not just for now, but going on. So a decision you make now, you actually have to defend it going on like nuclear waste. Um, and there's all sorts of other examples like that. Um, the use of driver's license photos is a particularly annoying one for me. Around the country, they've all now been put into a national bi biometric database. When the photos were collected, we were told that was for the purposes of a driver's license. And you couldn't have a driver's license without a photo and it seemed quite legitimate. I could imagine why you'd want my photo on a driver's license. So if the police pulled me over, I could see it really was my license and not someone that they could see that. So it all seemed quite legitimate at the moment it was collected. But then once it was collected, then they decide to use it for other things. And they, I don't even think that to pass legislation. I think it was just by regulation. So now that data's hoovered up and it's gone to the feds. And everyone has it and it can be put into a national biometric database. I can now can be put into AI programs written, I hope not by our own students, but that now will scan through surveillance camera footage and identify people and work out who's who and, and everything like that. It's all cross-linked and the government thinks it's wonderful and the police think it's wonderful and it is wonderful for all sorts of things, but actually it's a bit more surveillance state now. And the point is, I guess if we'd been asked up front, can everyone go down to the police station and have their photo taken so we can put you in a large national biometric database and identify people from surveillance camera? Then we'd have had a big debate and they probably wouldn't have been able to get away with doing it. But they collected the data without having the debate and they changed the rules on us. And this is the insidious thing about forward secrecy. All right, the second point to talk about is bigness. So when you collect data, it's a piece of data and it might not seem to be worth anything. The real value of data comes from, this is the equivalent of the network effect, the real, oh, Here's my mic. I didn't put the mic on. Does that sound better now? Oh man, I sounded like I was in the toilet before. I wonder why. Listen to that. I think that's heaps better. Ha! Oh, it's an idiot. So I'm sorry about that. That's why you can't trust governments. You can't even trust your lecturer to put a microphone on. How can you trust the government? Because they only need to make a slip up once in protecting the data and it's gone. We make slip ups all the time. I'm a great advocate for that. A great example of that. Um, so um, a piece of data might not be worth much, but aggregations of data are worth more. So the example we did um, in the lecture was we did a game of 20 questions. I don't know if you know that game, where um, one of the people, I can't remember who it was that did it. Uh, oh, I think I picked the thing and someone had to ask me 20 yes, no questions. And I picked, the UNSW library, and they asked a series of random questions initially. And after the first four or five questions, it probably seemed pretty hopeless to everyone watching and listening. Well, they're never gonna get this. They asked, oh, is it an animal or something? I'm going, no. Is it a this, no? Is it a this, no? And you're thinking, could be anything. But by about 10 questions, it started to narrow it down. And in the low teens, somehow they worked out it was a building. Wow. And then, um, and then they found it quite quickly. So and we got it in under 20 questions. So it was quite miraculous. And I love this with 20 questions. You should play 20 questions as a homework exercise with, with a flatmate or someone. It's so compelling because each time for me, it has this property when you're the guesser that it seems impossible. I can never do this in 20. It seems impossible. It seems impossible. And suddenly bang, you get it. And why are you getting it? Because if the questions are, are asked well, if they're well-designed questions, 
the answer to each question rules out half the possibilities. Whether they say yes or no, it doesn't matter, it rules out half the possibilities. So you ask four questions, you've ruled out half the possibilities, then half the possibilities, then half of what's left, then half of what's left, you're down to a 16th. So what's that, about 6% of all the possibilities. You ask 10 questions, after 10 halvings, you're down to 1,000th, 1.1 of a percent of the possibilities are left. You ask 20 questions, you guys tell me, 20 questions. How many things can you identify in 20 yes, no questions? If you halve each time, well, two to the 20 things. That's a thousand times a thousand, two to the 10 times two to the 10. That's a million. So you can identify one of a million things in 20 questions and probably our, our imaginations aren't good enough that it's pretty, we share a common set of a million things. It'd be pretty hard to not guess it in 20 questions. It's possible because clearly there's more than a million things in the world. Um, but we tend to pick them from a smaller pool like passwords. Okay, so the point of that whole exercise was to show that each individual question that this very friendly student was asking, but I can't remember who she was, I'm sorry. Each individual question seemed pointless and didn't seem to have much value and didn't seem to help very much. But the aggregate of them was incredible because they had a mul multiplicative, well, an exponential, well, a multiplicative, that's it, a multiplicative effect. As you added each one, the value of them all was better than the value of them all added together. It's like if you've got a set or something of something, it's worth much more than all the individual things added together. There are a few things in economics where that happens. And this is a very powerful example where the value of something isn't the linear sum of all the components, but the components interact and it's the collection effect. And, and that is huge. We see that in the networking effect. You'll sometimes see when you talk about um, in networking situations, um, when else does it happen? Sometimes it happens in marketing information in systems, but it always happens with information. So, if, if two companies that hold information merge, the value of the information when that's joined is more than twice the individual, the sum of the individual piece of information. So it's in everyone's interest to do it. So there's this crazy market effect. And this is why Google and Amazon get so big because the bigger they get, the more value their information has. They get one more little piece of information about you. You think it's not worth much, but to them now in conjunction with all the other pieces of information they've got, it's worth heaps. It's incredibly valuable. So, um, so anyway, people like collecting data. They like collecting lots of data. And the more data you have, the more value it's got faster, far faster than you expect that that grows. So they put it not in data pools like we used to have. They call them data lakes now. And companies manage data lakes, huge lakes of data. And they're never going to get rid of them because it's valuable. The aggregation is the important thing here. Uh, now, sometimes people say, don't worry about giving us this data. So we're going to de-identify it. So we'll get the value of the data, but we won't connect it to your identity. We'll remove the authentication components. And that sort of sounds plausible. And if they tell you how they're de-identifying the data, they're introducing noise, they're not, they're not giving full data, all sorts of things like that. It sounds okay. But just notice that each piece of data they're getting is like a question in 20 questions. And if there's desensitizing and adding noise and censoring bits out, then it's a worse question, but it's still a question. It doesn't have no value, otherwise they wouldn't want the data. So it's got some value. So you still get the aggregation effect and the aggregation is exponential. So even with a lot of crap data, you can get good data from it. So if say we got all the Opal data, we took everyone's names off it. I could probably still work out which person was me very quickly from that data set because it's just a few little characteristics. Do this trip every day, sometimes trouble with this person who has this characteristic trip. That's probably found me straight away. If not, here's a day I didn't do anything. Here's a day I did two trips, it was unusual. Bang, you've certainly got me then. So people can talk about the identification and they say the words the identification so confidently and statistical people get together and give you elaborate statistical arguments and mathematical arguments even sometimes the formal people get involved. Uh, so proving that something's been identified and is completely safe. But I just want you to know you've got to be skeptical and that's rubbish because it's not completely safe. And individual safety of individual pieces of data doesn't help you. It's the safety of the aggregate. And if top men tell you, no, we've thought about that. We've thought of all the ways people could aggregate it and it's still safe. I say, yeah, well, maybe, for all, maybe if you haven't made a mistake, all the ways you've thought about can't be done. But you can't prove that there isn't a way because, you know, this is a growing field and people will get more and more and bigger and bigger data sets. So 
de-identification, you just can't do it. But anyway, that was a theoretical problem with de-identification. The real problem, the pressing and immediate problem, is that people don't even do it competently. So the, I think it was a Victorian government that released a whole lot of medical records recently. Ah, ten minutes to go. Um, uh, the Victorian government that released a whole lot of medical records recently to let people crowdsource them and do citizen science on them and do all sorts of useful things, um, that data was re-identified by some people, I think from Melbourne Uni. I think it was Vanessa Teague. Um, de-identified, re-identified quite quickly. It was quite trivial for them to, everyone says, don't worry, you can trust us, we've de-identified it. 10 minutes later, ooh, I managed to re-identify 90% of the data. So the government leapt to action. And this is the interesting thing here. The government had, it had just been clear that they'd been holding out false hope and that the data hadn't been correctly de-identified and that they had a systemic problem. So what did they do? How did they fix that problem? Well, I did it the classic way. They made it illegal to re-identify data. <laughs> and who does that stop? Does that stop the criminals from re-identifying the data? No, that stops researchers, the good guys from re-identifying the data. So it actually just stops people finding out that the data can't be re-identified. <laughs> Will they ever delete the data from their data lake? No, I've tried to get people to delete data from their data lake saying, the only way you can safely store this is to not store it. Just delete it, you don't need it anymore. Just delete it, delete, 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 then it's safe. And they say, no, maybe one day it'll be useful. You never know. We're going to keep it. Pfft, they've lost it. Um, all right. So super fast. Sometimes people say data want to be free. Data wants to be free. This is an idea of open government. The idea of open government is government has a whole lot of data and they don't really know how to use it. Well, they probably do, but they, there's a big pool of people out in the community and companies that could use the data to do good too. Let's put that data out there and let everyone use it and see what value to the whole country can accumulate from sharing all the data we have or some of it. And the proponents of this say data wants to be free. We've got this big data set. We've got a big data lake. Let's release it and let's see what value can be generated from it. Maybe people will work out new routes we should do or write or some apps that let people do timetabling or work out socioeconomic things or criminal patterns or where we should have more police or where we need more bridges or, you know, who knows what people will work out. They're really clever. Let's release this data and do it. Uh, and to be safe, we'll de-identify it first, of course. <laughs> um, so I just want to look at that statement. The people that want to free the data, the data that they think wants to be free, what data is that? I'm prepared to take a bet with someone that the data they're talking about sharing isn't their own personal data, it's other people's data. So the data that I think wants to be free is your data. <laughs> we saw that best with Mark Zuckerberg when he was being uh, interviewed. I don't know if anyone saw that uh, or grilled uh, in, uh, by the American lawmakers. Uh, and uh, it was a very scripted performance. Uh, it's well worth watching though, because it's quite funny. But my favorite bit was when someone asked him, uh, would it be all right if we told everyone what hotel you were staying at now? Would it be all right if we told everyone your personal data right now? Is that, you know, this sort of data you say is fine to share is, would you like it if we shared yours? And he actually had to say, um, no, I wouldn't like that. It was such a great moment around the world. Everyone was cheering. Um, so the other things about open government is if you can look at what the government's doing, then you can spot problems with it. Now that's a good sort of open government. In other words, it's an engineering principle, peer review, get many eyes on something to look for problems. Weirdly, governments like the data wants to be free sort of openness, but it's very hard to find governments that like the, let's let other people look at what we're doing and find our mistakes sort of things. We do have legislation. There was an enthusiastic rush probably in the nineties or eighties. I can't remember exactly when to do embrace this sort of idea of allowing people observe government and seeing how it operates. We have freedom of information legislation at a federal level, state level, we have the Gipper Act. Um, uh, and you can request data on what the government's done and observe what they're doing, but um, constantly being shut down and nailed down and restricted and restricted and restricted. Um, there are exemptions where they don't have to tell you things. And gee, a lot of the times those exemptions mysteriously seem to apply and you can't find out if they apply because they're secret. Oh, this is cabinet and confidence. Oh, this is commercial proprietary. Oh, this is, yeah. So they can, they can make, they, are the, the, they decide and release. Now they do, to be fair, have departments that make the decision that are supposed to be operating in harmony. But yeah, the whole system is uh, less than perfect. So you might want to find out about FOI uh, and how that's working in Australia. Uh, and you might want to think about Gipper. In previous years, we've encouraged everyone to lodge FOI requests or Gipper requests. And we've had a centralized way of doing that. Uh, so we didn't bombard agencies with them. 
Um, we're not going to do it this year because time's a bit pressing and everything's gone crazy with the virus. But I do encourage you to work out how to lodge a GIPA um, request. And if anyone wanted to, um, be happy to give you help in doing it. It costs 20 bucks, I think. Or I think one of them's free, might be FOI, and GIPA might cost 20 bucks. You've got to word it right or they'll turn it down. And then there's a whole lot of things to put in there that they'll turn it down for. But yeah, you can start requesting data. All sorts of interesting things you can ask about. All sorts of interesting things. And I have to tell you. Here I've listed some of the laws that apply to cyber. Uh, you might want to find out about them because I've just put the interesting ones there. Oh, I haven't put the Defence Trade Controls Act in. I'll add that in. Yeah, you might just want to read about that. That's all interesting stuff and secrets. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to say, um, oh yeah, secrets by the state. Yeah, so the idea is the state quite likes privacy for itself. <laughs> It's not for its citizens, <laughs> who'd have thought? So um, we have uh, the, this notion of the different estates, the different parts of a society that monitor each other. And the fourth estate is the press who monitor and look after what's going on by making things open, finding information and publishing things like WikiLeaks or uh, the Pentagon Papers uh, from Ellsberg and all that sort of stuff, all the scandal stuff that gets released, that leads to royal commissions. Um, this is a really important role paid by free press. Um, so that is one way we get data on the government. Rather than asking them to give it to us, we, in, we interrogate and try and find it actively ourselves. That's a good thing to do. And of course, if you're a government, if we just go back, no one really wants to. But engineers should. I mean, we should all be. It's like bug bounty. More eyes looking. You want to find mistakes. Don't worry about blame and looking stupid. Find the mistakes and fix them. That's really the engineering story. Why utterly endorse this. And the last thing I wanted to say, and I won't get to play it now, but maybe you can. There are benefits to sharing and collaboration. So privacy is like a two sided thing. You can't go nuts and ignore it. That's what we're sort of doing now. But too much privacy and too much intellectual property, too much not sharing. That's not good. Mankind advances by getting ideas, sharing them around, getting data and sharing them around, getting science and Lots of good in that. And this one little clip here was from Deliverance. It's the joining banjo story. Deliverance is apparently a very daring person. So don't watch it, but do watch this clip. And then she'll have Because it just shows two people collaborating to make music and music. And what I like about the clip in my closing seconds is the guy that thinks he's fantastic and he thinks the boy's a bit of a retard. I think at one point, you know, it's just about this little boy playing the band. Um, uh, then the more he plays, the more wonderful he realizes a musician. The boy. At the end, the guy goes, "I'm lost. I can't do it." And the boy's still going. That's just fantastic. I love that too. Uh, so that is wonderful. We might want that. Okay. So it was lovely doing this lightning, um, super fast lecture with everyone. I see extra people have come. Brendan, you came. Lisa, you're there. Tim's there. Michael, David, Alana, you're there all along. Thank you. And uh, Jazz, I saw you pop in. Thank you. That was really nice. And me and Oliver again. Oh, here are all my notes. You can see my notes. Um, oh, it's my password. <laughs> see you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. It was a real pleasure.